You knew that. Thanks, Anna. Um, you, know, you might know me as Piscis aureus. It means, like, let me clear this up for once. It means golden fish. I don't know. It's a very lame history why I picked that Twitter name. Um, you might know me from Node and from LibUV. I, I, I actually work on LibUV if I do Node stuff. And indeed, Strongloop. Strongloop is nice. But I'm, what, I, what I'm going talk to talk about today is Node 2.0. Um, this is obviously a troll slide. I, I, actually, I wanted to put there, introducing Node 2.0. And, you know, fuck you, Michael, something like that. Um, <laughs> but let's not do that. Um, this is, yeah, it's actually a trolley slide. But I think uh, there is some point in starting to think about Node 2.0. And the reason is very simple. Node 1.0 is, well, it, the API is finalized. We're working on performance. Um, and, uh, but uh, we sort of know what it will look like. But it doesn't mean that Node is now perfect. We can make it better, in my opinion, and how I will... Uh, explain or like one part of it I will explain in this talk. I, I, I have some mantras now. I mean, uh, one of the things we really need to figure out is how to actually, like, you know, everybody thinks it's easy to scale Node, but it's actually not easy. So I, we have to think about that too. But um, this is about something else. Um, the beginning is a little bit abstract, so you understand where, what I'm coming from. And after that, I will show you a code, a, a lot of code, way too much code probably again. Um, but try to stay awake. So, um, uh, it was, um, let me see, yeah, so it was this summer, and in the summer what happens, well, at least the, the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, people have too much time on their hands. Um, so, so people started posting stuff to the Node mailing list, and it would have topics like future of asynchronous programming in Node, also known as like, when can we finally have generators or whatever. Um, or the future of Node Streams, we need to talk because, you know, Streams 3 apparently is also not good and we need Streams 4. So, and what happens is the, the typical response from the Node community is now, no, 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 let's not do that. Let's not go there. We are just about to have Node 1.0. Let's not start discussing these things. And usually, okay, um, let's not do it too much, but sometimes it's nice. One, uh, one post, I think this was written by Miguel uh, de Casa. You might know him from Mono. Um, uh, was, uh, was called callbacks as our generation's go-to statement. And that one particularly resonated with me because it made me think of um, this. Anyone wrote this language when he was young? When I was eight, I think, or, or nine maybe, I wrote GW Basic. And what it didn't have is uh, uh, functions. Or even, like, I think other versions of GW Basic had um, at, at GoSub, but it didn't have that either. So I would inv invent my own functions, which is you basically store the return address, which was a line number, and line was 80. You see there, R is 80, that would be the return uh, uh, address. And then you know, go to another line and then do something and then make it go to back, back to the return line. Um, that was very, oh, but that works, except Every now and then you had to call renum because you would like want to insert some lines and then this would be all broken again. You would have to redo your whole application. Uh, it was really terrible. And the funny thing is, though, um, like nobody really, and, and, and then, and it probably uh, happened uh, before uh, G, GW Basic even, um, that Edsger Dijkstra, that's how you pronounce that, Edsger Dijkstra, has said, go to is like, it's terrible, you should never do that. Um, and, and obviously, what he didn't mean is like go to itself is, is lame, but it's not the good way to program stuff. But everybody understands that a for loop and a while, while loop and an if statement are basically just glorified go to statements. Um, and so we have the same problem with callbacks. Like nobody argues that callbacks are broken, um, but there's like not, they're not really nice to write your own code with. So. To, to show you some examples, like this is a common pattern. This is implementing a semaphore. And it's weird that you even need it in a, in a single thread language. And, and people do this all the time. Like I have two things, two asynchronous things, and I have to wait for the result. So, well, I have to count, and then if it, the count goes to zero, I go to the next step, whatever it is. Uh, oh, sorry, let's go back. Because this thing is actually even worse. Um, this is sort of extracted from something in Node Core we do um, related to transform streams. And what happens is people call a callback, but we're never really sure if they do it on the next stick or you know, somewhere in the future or just uh, do it right away. So we have to make sure it happens on the next stick, but 
to not lose too much performance. We do crazy stuff like this. And it might happen in your code as well. You should not have to deal with this stuff. That's my opinion, and um, that's what I'm set out to do. Um, there's, there's other problems, like write a robust node app. I think many people have this problem, like it's, you can do great things in five minutes when you write node code, um, but then if you put it in production, it will crash all the time. Um, and that's basically because, you know, you don't know if close, if a stream will emit close after it had an error, or so you get like double callbacks or missed callbacks. You don't know what to do if you have an error, like, oh, where do I go now? Um, uh, this aggravates, like, the intern wrote the contact form problem. This, that's what I call it. If you have a PHP website, you can make the intern do the contact form because, you know, if it breaks, then the rest of your site will still keep working. Um, that's not the case in Node. If your intern makes a mistake, then your program will crash all the time. Anyway, and also ad hoc ironing out uh, of, of flow control kinks, as I just showed you, like, doing stuff with making sometimes next sticking, sometimes not, and that kind of stuff. Anyway. Um, so, it, oh, to make it even worse, like look at uh, this code. I tried to do curl in Node one day, and and the funny thing is, let me do, let me violate speaker 101, like walk out of the light. Look, look here, function make callback, and then oh, if we call it already, then we probably set it to zero. Yeah, like, so uh, where do we even do that? Oh yeah, here we set it to null because that that ensures that we never actually call the callback twice, otherwise we will not be sure if it will keep working. Anyway, um, so let's, let's see how we can fix this. Um, in, in the past, uh, Node had promises, and, and they still exist, and I think Dominic De Nicola will uh, talk later today about how to troll W3C into accepting your standard, so you can stuff, get stuff in through the back door. I'm not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, promises are not really, they don't really solve this problem. And actually, they were ripped out of Node Core because they were too opinionated, too many people would uh, you know, like to bike shed at new small features. So at some point, Ryan Dahl actually just moved the whole, thing, the whole thing out of Core, out of the way, and just went for a very simple model, which is go-tos or callbacks. Um, but I would like to propose a better construct. And it should, exp like, like for loops, like while loops, like functions, it should be sort of built on top of callbacks, but um, it should express intent and abstraction and not, as, not necessarily just what happens under the hood. Um, and it should help you to build robust applications that don't crash and be sort of unopinionated, like be boring, be obvious. Uh, so you, like this talk should be like very yawn-inducing in a way. Uh, and it should not break too many existing apps or modules. We don't want that to happen. Um, and so what I think is, is the right way to, to, to do this is have an asynchronous try and catch block. And this, we cannot change the language, so we could not actually do this, but think of it as, as something that looks like this. Um, you have a, a big try block, and you can do a lot of asynchronous stuff in there, and you know, it just happens as it always did. And then you have a catch block, or, and that always runs even if it succeeded. Um, and that doesn't run before everything, before that is over. And if you um, throw somewhere in the try block or in a, uh, in a, in a um, asynchronous operation related to the try block, then we will try to clean up the rest and go to the, the catch finally thing that I described here. So what you could do here is, for example, yeah, su succeed this whole thing with a value or throw in there, and that would go to the callback. Um, but let's see. Um, if you would put a set timeout around it, it wouldn't matter. It, like, it would still know no, no, it's all contained in this thing, and the catch finally async blah blah block would not run until the set timeout was run. It seems very obvious, right? Um, so since we cannot change the language, we have to make it a little bit more verbose. So what I was, will propose is to use um, task.create. So think of uh, the thing that runs in the try block as a task, something that you want to, like that has, that has meaning, it's not something, uh, it's not how the system works, but how you think of it, for example, render a template or service an incoming connection. Um, and, and, and you give it a closure that will run, and whatever happens in the closure will be sort of kept track of by node, and eventually we will make the callback. <clears throat> so, and these, 
these can actually be nested, um, which is nice because that means that you have a sort of another uh, stack of another way of abstracting the things that happen in your, in your program. So for example, in this case, I would have created a task, but another task in it, which would do some stuff and a timeout. And if the timeout runs and it takes too long and we throw, and throwing means node will decide to clean everything up that's, that's going on or might be left behind and then go to, call, to the callback. It makes it very easy to reason about what's going to happen. So for, like, for example, node has a very nice function that is sort of this. It is like fs.read file and it has a callback. And you know what's going inside, on inside fs.read file? A lot of stuff. Um, but it, like, it appears as like a contained thing. It can fail or it can succeed and you don't have to worry about it. And that's like how you probably want to structure your code as well. But if you actually look in the current implementation of fs.read file, you will find craft like this. Like if an error happens, oh shit, then we need to not forget to close the file descriptor and then go to uh, make the callback. Actually, it's more complicated than this if you look at the actual code. And in fact, what we would do probably is something like this. So, you have, suppose you have existing code that does everything in an obvious non-error handling way. You open a file and then you do read for a while and then after a while you go to, uh, you figure out there's no more data in the file, you go to close. And everywhere, if an error happens, you can just throw it and it's fine because the, the task sort of container will handle the error for you. Um, <clears throat> so, that's easy. We have a problem though and um, because if this were true, I mean, it was, om was almost too good to be true and it would already be done. But the problem is called event emitter. Um, and the reason is very simple. You could do it this way. And if you do, did this, create a connection within a task, it would all work. Uh, but what people do, obviously, is, uh, I don't know, share a connection. For example, they will connect to a database um, and then to MySQL, for example. And I don't think www.google.com runs MySQL, but anyway, um, that's a mistake from, on my end. Uh, what happens is in many tasks, in many, for example, if you make every uh, incoming client a, a task, um, the people will use the same connection to the database over and over again. And then, you know, your MySQL module will have to parse responses from MySQL and like figure out where to go again. So now we have, we have sort of a problem. So what we need to do <clears throat> is define what happens if you share stuff between multiple tasks. So I'm also um, suggesting we make a small change here. Um, build something on top of event emitter, which is just a little bit smarter, so it is more predictable on how it fails and when it fails and stuff. Um, so what will happen is if you have a task and you interact with a, with a resource, a stream would be a resource, like a connection pool would be a resource, um, you become vulnerable. So that means that if the resource goes wrong, you will die, basically. That's, it's sad, but it's true. Unless you decide, well, I know how to handle an error in your task, not somewhere in your task. You need to specify how you will handle a problem with your shared resource. So for example, um, in, in case of, of a connection that's shared between multiple tasks, you would say, well, I have an, add an error handler within my task. And the default behavior would be, so this would be actually not necessary, it would be to throw, and if you throw in your task, then no problem, it will just fail, like contain the failure anyway. So it's not, it's not a big deal. Um, and then there are some other details, listeners are ended when the resource is closed, and um, you are not supposed to go emit on like something else. Like for example, people do it now. Like process dot standard in dot emit key press. Don't do that. Or even worse, error. They will emit an error on an ob other object because you know something went wrong there. It doesn't know itself. Um, so there are some there some rules are involved, but it's not it's not extremely complicated. I will not detail this right now because I have more stuff to show. Um, which is this? Imagine a timeline of a node application. Like everything eventually starts at the first tick, which is, can, is, it, is this sort of readable? I don't think so. But the white block on the top left says first tick. And on the first tick, you might start a set timeout and you'd make, um, you might start sort of an accept operation. Accept operation means 
you're going to accept an incoming connection, for example, HTTP uh, client. And if someone, if, if when the accept completes, you will have a callback. And from the callback, you will spin off a read operation because you're going to read from the connection. And then after, you, after you're done reading, you will start writing and then shut down, etc. So this is all nice. The only problem is that Node, when at a particular point in time, Node doesn't know what's going on. It knows, for example, it could be there. Um, and what it knows at that point is it is in the callback for a read operation, and it's about to spin off a write operation in response to that. And then there's like some set time on out lingering, but it doesn't know why, and some other read lingering, and it doesn't know why. Um, and yeah, that's just because how Node works. Um, and it actually cannot look into the future and has forgotten all about the past. So we cannot really change that. But what we could do if we had tasks is we would basically put like large squares around these timelines. And at any point in time, Node would know, well, I am now in a callback, but it belongs to that task. And if you nest task, you would actually have two. You would have like a big task and a smaller task in it. And then you have your stack within that task, which means um, that if you also happen to be able to name those tasks, and that's, that fits very well in the, to the API, just name the function, the, the, the function that uh, you pass to task.create, you can get very useful stack traces. Because suddenly, well, in this case, I did inner task and outer task, but you have to imagine it could be, you know, connect to database, which is part of render a template, which is part of handle an incoming connection. So suddenly, it, it's no longer all useless internal node stuff that you see in stack traces. I think that would be very helpful for many people. Um, then there's more goodies. I'm not going to discuss them either because I'm running out of time, I think. Um, but for example, what we like to do with strong loop, we have strong ops, and there's also new relic, and they like to measure your application, actually show like what's the latency of some stuff and how much actual CPU time does it use. You know, those applications can't really tell you anything useful because, because of how callbacks work, it, they always lose track of what's going on. And if you actually describe, you know, the intent of what your app is doing or what parts of your app are doing, then they could actually measure what's going on. Just another example of what, what we might do with this. Um, I will leave it here. Um, what's next? I, I, I was planning to actually show you something today. I just got it working yesterday. I didn't really dare to do it on stage. Um, you can follow me, though. Uh, I will like vigorously tweet about it when it's done and ready to try out. Or you can talk to me. I'll be around. I'll be at the party. I'll be relaxing after doing this talk. I'll be totally zoned out. So um, please do so and rant about it and give me suggestions and try to break my thoughts here because you know we can only get this right or wrong ones, and we cannot try over and over again. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention.